All right, so we should be all set. This is March 26th. This is Algebra 2 CP A1. Again, make sure you fill in that attendance form. If you do have any questions, just feel free to go ahead and say so. But I want to start by uh, just referring to our sheet from last time. I gave you just three problems to try in preparation for this class, just as a sort of wrap up to what we've been talking about. Um, I don't plan on going over them with you, but you should have been able to get the right answers on those because those were direct translations of the problems we did last time. If you do have any questions on them, uh, we should have some time at the end. So if you'd like to at the end, just say, hey, Mr. Giorgio, I really didn't understand problem number two. Do you mind going over it? That's totally fine. But I do want to make sure we get through what we need to get through for the day first. So if you do have questions on those three problems, uh, make sure just hold them off to the end and we'll address them then. If you have um, any other concerns though, again, just feel free to speak up in the middle of this. So today I'd like to continue now that we sort of reviewed and recapped and got right back to where we were, I'd like to continue our discussion of solving radical equations. And you may notice something kind of strange about the equation that I just put on the paper for you. This is an equation that we really haven't seen before. We really haven't seen anything quite like this. It's an equation where we really have two square roots, but they also cannot be isolated because we have this lingering constant on the outside. You know whenever we have to solve one of these radical equations, our first step is usually to isolate the radical. Well, in this case, how is it possible to isolate the radical? If, if I have the plus one over here, then this radical is not isolated. Sure, you could subtract the one and move it over there, but now this radical wouldn't be isolated. So in a problem like this, it would not be possible to isolate both radicals at the same time. And this is definitely what I'd refer to as an advanced level solving problem. It essentially requires two steps of distributing, one to get rid of the first radical and one to get rid of the second radical. All right, um, so let's see what we can do. So that, that's pretty much what we're going to do. That's the process we're really going to go for is we're going to try to, number one, square both sides to get rid of one of the radicals and then square both sides again to get rid of the other radical. So it really requires two distribution steps. So let's go ahead and get started with our first problem. Now, again, it's impossible to isolate both radicals at the same time. So I'll just have to settle for the one that is isolated by squaring both sides to get rid of it. So if I square both sides, notice on the right side, the square and square root will cancel out. That leaves me with one minus eight X, just like we saw before on that right side. So that right side really shouldn't be very tricky. The left side, however, is more of a challenge. How do I square something like this? Well, just like before to square something, I'm going to multiply it by itself. So let's do exactly that. I'm gonna do one plus the square root of negative two minus six X times itself one plus the square root of negative two minus six x and we're going to have to do a little bit of first outer inner last in order to be able to multiply that the distributive property right so let's go ahead and get that done what i'm going to do is again first one times one is one now this may look a little intimidating but think of if it were just a regular old variable i did one times the square root of negative two minus six x that's just going to be the square root of negative two minus six X. Again, think of this word just X, right? If I did one times X, you would all write X, right? If I did two times X, you would all write two X. If I'm doing now one times this, well, it's just that. If it were two times this, then it would be two square root of negative two minus six X. So it's really just a direct translation from there. The inner multiplication, if you notice, is exactly the same. I have negative two, uh, the square root of negative two minus six x times one is just itself. And then the last multiplication, the square root of negative two minus six x times the square root of negative two minus six x. Just to show you a little off to the side here, we're doing the square root of negative two minus six x times the square root of negative two minus six x. Well, that's really just the square root of negative two minus six X times itself, or in other words, the square root, square root of negative two minus six X squared, right? And then the square and square root would cancel out. So you'd really just get negative two minus six X, and that's all equal to one minus eight X. 
the square root of negative 2 minus 6x times the square root of negative 2 minus 6x is just negative 2 minus 6x. It's like if you said, what's the square root of 7 times the square root of 7? Well, that's just 7. What's the square root of 11 times the square root of 11? That's just 11. Same deal here. The square root of negative 2 minus 6x times the square root of negative 2 minus 6x is negative 2 minus 6x. Hopefully no questions on that. But again, if you do have a question, feel free to ask. Now what I have to do is I can essentially clean up this left side a little bit, squish these radicals together, and combine some like terms. If you notice, we have a couple like terms here. This 1 and this minus 2. Combining them together will give us a negative 1. So let's note that. I have this negative 6x. That doesn't really combine with anything, so we just have now minus 6x. And now I have the square root of negative 2 minus 6x plus another square root of negative 2 minus 6x. So how many of those do I have? I now have two square roots of negative 2 minus 6x is equal to now 1 minus 8x. That right side still hasn't changed. And again, that's just the same thing as if you had x plus x. You would write 2x. Well, I have now one of these radicals plus another one of these radicals makes in total two of those radicals, right? So now that I have that, we can go ahead and isolate the radical and square both sides again. What I've done, if I, I've essentially reduced my two radical problem now down to a one radical problem, just like we've seen before. So I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to add the one over to the other side. I'm also going to add the 6x over to the other side. And I now have 2 times the square root of negative 2 minus 6x is equal to 2 minus 2x. Okay. Hopefully no questions so far, but again, if you do have a question, feel free to chime in and just ask. All right. Uh, so now that I'm at this step, there's a very important note that I want to make at this step that can help make your life a lot easier. Do you see this coefficient of 2 out in front of this square root? Well, you could leave that there if you so desire and just square both sides. That'll become 4 because 2 squared is 4. But it does make your life a lot harder. It's much easier, if you can, to divide by this coefficient of 2. So if you notice that every term here seems to be divisible by this coefficient, then divide and get rid of it. If you notice that that's not the case, because that won't be the case in every problem in particular, then you kind of just got to work with it. But we'll see one uh, problem where that's not the case coming up in just a little bit. Uh, but here I would notice, so I'm going to note, that if it is possible, slide my keyboard out of the way, if it is possible to divide by the coefficient, of the radical evenly, then do it. It'll make your life a lot easier in just working with smaller numbers. So at this step, again, it's not a guarantee that that's always going to be the case. But here, I see that, oh, I could just go ahead and divide everything by 2. The 2s will cancel out. Here we'll do some reducing. You're going to get the square root of negative 2 minus 6x is equal to now 2 divided by 2 is 1 minus, again, 2 divided by 2 is 1 times x. Any questions on how we reduced from here to here? Or actually, why we reduced from there to there? Seems like everybody's soaking it in the processing very good fantastic happy to hear that all right so now going forward from here this is now just a problem that we're used to right if you took a look on that assignment the distance learning assignment that i gave you for today really these are problems just like the equations that we did before where you now have to just square both sides you'll have to do a little bit of distributing on the right and then simplify so we're going to do exactly that we're going to square both sides the square and square root cancel out. I now have negative 2 minus 6x is equal to a little first outer inner last required over here. 1 minus x times itself. 1 minus x again. I now get negative 2 minus 6x is equal to 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times negative x is negative 1x. Another one we get negative 2x. And then I get plus, because negative times a negative would be a positive, 
plus x squared. Now, just like yesterday, or I keep saying, I'm going to keep saying yesterday, I'm going to make that mistake all day. Just like the previous class, which is on Tuesday, you, you see that value of x squared. And as soon as you see x squared show up, that should be an immediate indication that we need to factor. You absolutely have to factor when you see that x squared show up. But of course, before you factor, it makes a lot of sense to set equal to zero. So I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to add 6x over to this side. I'm also going to add 2 over to this side. And so we now get 0 is equal to x squared plus 4x plus 3. And that's definitely an expression that we can go ahead and factor. I'm going to say that 0 is now equal to, let's see, we need x and x to multiply to x squared. Since everything is positive, it makes sense to keep these positive. And now we're just looking for factors of 3 that can somehow combine to give us this value of 4 in the middle. And that's just going to be 3 and 1. So I now get two potential solutions, one of x equals negative 3 and one of x equals negative 1. Cool. Definitely a long problem. When you actually step back from that and look at it at a glance, I, I understand that it can look very intimidating. However, these are all steps that you should be comfortable performing. Yes, it's a lot of steps, but there isn't really anything new per se. We're just squaring both sides, which you're comfortable with, doing the distributive property, the same rules, quote unquote, or the same actions would apply if this were just a regular old x. It just so happens to be this radical, where I now do 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times this is that, 1 times this is that again, and the square root of negative 2 minus 6x times the square root of negative 2 minus 6x is negative 2 minus 6x. Now it's a matter of combining like terms, dividing if possible, which helps minimize our values, make it so we work with smaller numbers. And then we get down to a problem that we should be familiar with. Square both sides, distribute, set up to factor, and get our answers. If, by the way, if you're wondering, what would happen if we did not divide by this 2? You would still get to the same result at the end. You would just have to take out a greatest common factor coming towards the end here. And you would end up with bigger numbers that you'd have to distribute. Notice that instead of distributing 1 minus x, you'd be distributing 2 minus 2x. So it just results in some slightly bigger numbers. Not as big of a deal when you're dealing with numbers like 1 and 2 but if I had say like 5 and 10 and or multiples of 5 or multiples of 6 it could definitely get to spiral into some large values awesome now again you may notice that I did say we still have potential solutions because absolutely we do have to check let's check when x is equal to negative 3 let's check for our extraneous solutions is it true that 1 plus the square root of negative 2 minus 6 times negative 3. All I'm doing is I'm taking this negative 3, plugging it way back up to the top. Is that equal to the square root of 1 minus 8 times negative 3? Well, let's find out. Here I have 1 plus, this is 18 minus 2, so 16. 1 plus the square root of 16. Is that equal to the square root of 25? I believe so, right? Because this is 1 plus 4 should equal 5 for sure, for sure. So. We're happy with our negative 3, which is good. Let's now check our x equals negative 1. Let's find out. When x is negative 1, is it true that 1 plus the square root of negative 2 minus 6 times negative 1, is that equal to the square root of 1 minus 8 times negative 1? Well, let's see. Here I get negative 2 plus 6, which is 4. Is that equal to the square root of 9? Absolutely, 100% it is. 1 plus 2 is certainly equal to 3. So we're happy on both sides. So this problem actually has two solutions. And the two solutions are x equals negative 3 and x equals negative 1. Yes, that was definitely a long problem. But again, I think it's a problem that you can certainly grapple with, especially if you practice, which not surprisingly, I am going to give you some problems to practice on your own in preparation for next class. Probably just like two problems because they do take a long time. But even so, doing those two problems will be very important for you. Be very important for you. Any questions? I dropped my pen under the desk. Okay. I now want to just do one more example with you. I'll go a little faster through this second one. Uh, just for the sake of time, but also because now that you've seen one of them, you should be able to to wrestle with another. All right, so I believe this is the problem I'd like to do with you. We have uh, another example. We have negative 1 plus the square root of negative 2 minus x is equal to the square root of 
negative 6 minus 2x. So let's give this problem a try. Same deal as before. You may notice that because of the fact that we have this constant over here, we have two radicals and a constant term. It's not possible to isolate both radicals at the same time. It just, just can't happen because this lingering negative 1 is either going to be over here or it's going to be stuck to this side as a positive 1 if you move it over. So we do just kind of got to deal with it. We just got to square both sides to eliminate one of the radicals, combine to a single radical problem, square both sides again. Ready? On the right side, the square and square root cancel out. I'm left with negative 6 minus 2x. On the left side, again, we just have to take that big uh, binomial and multiply it by itself. So I have my negative 1 plus the square root of negative 2 minus x times itself. Excellent. A little first outer inner last, the distributive property over here. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. Negative 1 times the square root of negative 2 minus x is exactly that. Negative the square root of negative 2 minus x. Notice we're going to have another one from the inner multiplication. So minus the square root of negative 2 minus x. And again, it's minus because it's negative 1 times that value. And lastly, I have the square root of negative 2 minus x times the square root of negative 2 minus x. Just like before, that is negative 2 minus x. And that's all equal to negative 6 minus 2x. Hopefully that makes sense. I think that's definitely the, the tough part, is getting to grips with that distribution. Now I'm just going to combine like terms. I have this 1. I have this negative 2. So in total, that's going to make negative 1. I have a negative x that doesn't really combine with anything, so minus x. I now have the opposite of this square root and another 1. So altogether, that makes negative 2 square root of negative 2 minus x. And again, that's still equal to our right side of negative 6 minus 2x. Hopefully still feeling good about that. Now I'm going to go ahead and just move everything over to the other side. I'm going to add 1 over to the other side. I'm going to add x over to the other side. We got negative 2 times the square root of negative 2 minus x is equal to, let's see, negative 6 plus 1, negative 5. Negative 2x plus x is negative 1x. Now here, I would look at, oh, by the way, one thing I want to point out before I forget, a super common mistake that a lot of students do, and it's an easy mistake to make, is a lot of students are very tempted to combine these like terms of negative 1 minus 2 and write this as negative 3. A lot of students tend to make that mistake. But this negative 2 is glued to this square root of negative 2 minus x. That's one term. It's just like if this were negative 2x. If this were, just to show you, if this were negative 1 minus 2x, you wouldn't combine those and say that's negative 3x, right? You wouldn't do that. The same thing applies up here. You wouldn't just rip those apart from each other. That's still just one collective term. So now, going forward from here, you may notice at this step that dividing by negative 2 wouldn't really help the cause because these values aren't divisible by negative 2. So we're kind of out of luck on that front, but that's okay. We can still work with it. I'm going to just go ahead and square both sides. Since we're multiplying here, we can say that negative 2 squared is positive 4. And the square root of negative 2 minus x squared is negative 2 minus x. So having that extra term out in front doesn't make it incredibly more difficult. It's just that now we got to deal with a little bit of distribution and some larger numbers on that left side. Here I'm going to go ahead and multiply my negative 5 minus x times negative 5 minus x. If you're wondering, hey, why did I have to write this out twice, just like I did up here, it's because we're multiplying these two things. It would, again, be just the same thing if I did negative 2x squared. That would be 4x squared, right? And that's very different from doing something like negative 2 plus x squared. Now, because that's a binomial, I have to multiply it by itself. I have to do negative 2 plus x times negative 2 plus x. And that's some distributing. You could see the same thing up here. If I did negative 2x squared, that's just negative 2x times negative 2x. And you would all, I'm pretty sure, write that as positive 4x squared. So the same exact logic applies over here. All right, getting back to the problem. Sorry, I was a little off track. Getting back to the problem. Now we're going to distribute this right side. Negative 5 times negative 5 is positive 25. Negative 5 times negative x is plus 5x. Notice I'm going to have another plus 5x in the middle, so altogether that's plus 10x. 
and negative x times negative x is positive x squared. Over on this side, I'm going to distribute the 4. I'm going to make this negative 8 minus 4x. Okay, last but most certainly not least, we see that x squared show up. Again, that's another indicator that I need to factor. But of course, before we factor, we got to set equal to 0. I'm going to add 4x over to this side. I'm going to add 8 over to this side. I'm also going to rearrange these terms so they're in a nice familiar factoring order. That's going to be x squared first plus 14x plus 33. Hopefully everybody sees how that works out, right? You see that I brought these terms over to the right side, and then I also rearranged them so they're all in the proper order. Now I can go ahead and factor that because we have our... Uh, quadratic in standard form. We need x and x in order to make x squared. Just like the last problem, everything's positive, so there's no reason to introduce any negatives. I'm now looking to multiply to this 33 and somehow combine to be this 14 in the middle. That's going to happen with 11 and 3. And so I end up with two potential solutions, one of x equals negative 11 and one of x equals negative 3. Okay, let's very quickly just go back and check those solutions. Then we should have about five minutes left if anybody has any questions or comments at the end. So let's take this negative 11, plug it back in. Is it true, let's check, when x is equal to negative 11, is it true that negative 1 plus the square root of negative 2 minus negative 11, be very careful with your negatives, is equal to the square root of negative 6 minus 2 times negative 11? Let's find out. Uh, I can go ahead and see, let's see, uh, this is going to be negative 2 plus 11, so this is the square root of 9. Negative 1 plus the square root of 9, is that going to be equal to, let's see, negative 2 times negative 11 is positive 22, minus 6 is the square root of four, uh, square root of 16, rather. So is negative 1 plus 3 equal to 4? Uh, I'm not convinced. I don't like that. I don't like that. So that means that our solution potentially of x equals negative 11 is in fact extraneous. But just like yesterday, or last class, I'm going to keep saying yesterday all day, just like last class, there is still hope because we still have to check for negative 3. Let's check when x is equal to negative 3. Is it true that negative 1 plus the square root of negative 2 minus negative 3, again being careful with our negatives, is equal to the square root of negative 6 minus 2 times negative 3? I believe this one works out. This is negative 1 plus the square root of 1. Is that equal to the square root of 0? It most certainly is because negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So this problem does have one solution and that one solution is negative 3. It can be the case where both solutions happen to be extraneous. And if both solutions happen to be extraneous, then you just say this problem has no solution. You would still have to note on any sort of assessment, though, that those two solutions are extraneous. So just keep that in mind. All right, so I was able to show you today, just a little recap, are two problems of what I would consider to be advanced level or difficult level solving equations problems. Yesterday, we sort of recapped our beginner and intermediate level. Yes, they are a lot of steps. Yes, I can definitely understand that looking at them from a glance, it's like, holy cow, pretty much one problem took up one page. And I totally get it. But just taking it one step at a time and practicing little by little, I, I guarantee that you'll be a-okay. Especially if you now have this video lesson to look back to and you use these problems as models, I think that you can manage. I'm going to give you probably about two or three problems. I haven't decided, uh, but whatever comes up. Oh, I'm going to probably make it tomorrow. I'll post it tomorrow. I'm going to give you that work just to do for in time for next class. I'll be happy to go over those problems at the start of next class and then start to transition into some word problems involving radicals. Again, I want to emphasize that the word problems involving radicals aren't necessarily designed to be super tricky, but they do involve working with formulas involving radicals. So I actually think they're I mean, I think math is pretty cool in general, but I actually think they're cool and useful because as concepts like that will especially come up in a class like pre-calculus if you're planning on taking pre-calc next year. Or, or uh, problem stats, too. You'll work with radicals a lot. So does anybody have, I'll open it up right now, does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns about what we did today, about the three problems that I asked you to do in preparation for today, or anything else?
take your silence as that there is no questions. Unless somebody's typing something in the chat, I'll give just a little bit of time to make sure nobody is typing anything. I mean, if there's no questions, then that, that, that's, that's great, but <laughs> I'm happy to answer any if you do have any. But I will give just a little bit of time. Hopefully it made sense. Hopefully it was clear. All right. All right. Well, it seems like there aren't any questions coming in, which I guess is a good thing. I guess that means it was super clear and understandable. I hope that it means that everybody's still engaged, correct? Everybody's still paying attention. Everybody's still getting their math on on this What's today? Thursday? Thursday morning? Yes, everybody's still getting their math on? Good. I hope so. All right, fantastic. That was a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed and hopefully it made sense to you. That's all I have for you today, so you can feel free to uh, jump out of here if you have somewhere else to be. But thanks again for your attention and focus. I appreciate your cooperation. And again, you can expect this video lesson to be online if you need to watch it. All right, I hope you all have a fantastic day, and I will see you on Monday. Oh, and a great weekend, because I won't see you tomorrow. So have a fantastic weekend as well.